So I'm um, happy to be here and happy to uh, well present you this paper and in the broader context of my research on labor market segmentation, uh, which is mainly in France, but also a lot of comparison with Britain, but we may discuss about other comparisons maybe. And just a word to tell you, you can of course interrupt me. So if you want to discuss one point, or maybe this is not the idea, we have the full discussion in the second of that. <laughs> okay, so keep your questions and we'll have a full time discussion in the second part of the session. And I'm gonna try and keep the time for this presentation. So uh, while it's called internal labor markets in Britain in France, which isn't very poetic as a title, but straightforward, mainly you know what it's about. And it's written with John Force, a, a British colleague actually, who is at um, Bayes Business School, which is dependent of University of London, and then I'm CNAM, and CEET, I don't know if you heard of, it's a laboratory which is focused on employment uh, topics, depending from the CNAM. Okay, so just to say a word, this is, the presentation is mainly based on a paper to be published, which is titled, uh, which titled this one. Oh. Uh, so you have to change page. Okay, but no, I don't see it. Just a second, here it is. Okay, so the motivation for the paper is the following. Well, I've been working on labor topics, mainly for France once again since years, and I'm an empirical researcher, so doing a lot of empirical research. And every time I would look at whatever topic on the labor market, I would find that some firms do accumulate every good opportunities and some others would accumulate the bad opportunities. In the same way, if you would like, uh, uh, if you would look at individual characteristics, well, you would find the bad characteristics, those yielding bad conditions in the labor market, focused on the same people, okay? So this kind of cumulative effect, which actually is typical of the French context. And actually, I would just find it again and again for the French context. So some firms, respectively some workers, would tend to accumulate all favorable or defavorable characteristics. From this point, you can of course raise a hypothesis that, okay, are these firms what used to be called ILM, internal labor markets? Well, this obviously hints to what happened in the 1970s when you would have this internal labor market, which would be the good places to be working in, where you could have a career, etc. And I'm sure you, hear, you heard about uh, this concept, and at least in your course with Antoine Reberiou yesterday. I don't know if all of you were concerned, but I'm sure you heard of it. And so the idea is, okay, are we seeing here some ILMs? But then, what is it, what, what would be, and how can we define ILMs today? Because what we know about ILM is mainly what has been defined in the 1970s. So, okay, this lookalikes, this looks alike ILM, but still, how close are we from something that is actually typical from 40 years ago? So, here we're gonna build on this base and also on the idea that well, since the ILM literature developed in the 70s and 1980s, it has clearly shown the usefulness of comparative analysis. Okay, it has been built on the US case first by Doringer and Fiori, but since the 1970s, just few years after, it has been brought in Europe in several different national contexts and really was very useful in different contexts and it also was very useful for the theory to come into different contexts and to really have, uh, well, has developed in this way. So we're gonna go this way and take advantage of some empirical data set, I will present more of course, but which is very rich, linked employer-employee data, so we can have this double view, and also very similar for Britain and France, because usually what we have that is international data is quite small in terms of topics, okay? It's focused on one theme, on one type of population, either workers or firms, rarely the two. 
or if it's the two, it's really on one topic, like working conditions, uh, pay structure. Here we'll see we have a very wide range survey, which is comparative. So it was really a nice place to start from. So given this motivation, the presentation outline now is going to go for the context and research questions. So a bit more on the context on the segmentation perspective. And second, I'll say more on data and method. Well, how did we define empirically ILMs? Because this is one of the big questions. It's originally some qualitative data that built the concept. So now we're in a quantitative context. How do we translate that? And well, of course, therefrom, once we have defined what we're calling ILM, we will look at what do they look like and which firms put them in place and discuss all these results. So I'm sorry, maybe we'll need a technical stop because I'm I can try that. Is that okay? For me it's okay. <laughs> Okay, sorry. Um, okay, so once again, so starting with context and research question. Just so I don't. So some things you may know or not. Just uh, tell me if you want me to go a bit slowly, more slowly, or or not. Uh, basically, basically, if we come back to the uh, well previous literature on labor market segmentation, which has been very important up to the 1990s, well, you would understand labor market functioning in different contexts, in different countries, and it was really the usual way to understand labor market functioning. And we would have two very typical type of ILMs, actually. One would be typical of the US, and France, but of course here I'm starting with France because we're <laughs> it's a paper on France. But obviously it was first developed for the US, but very quickly, very rapidly, researchers would say, okay, this concept is also very useful for France. And this is the classic internal labor market concept. And on the other hand, while the European, the German or Britain translation of the concept of ILM actually built built another concept which was occupational labor market because labor economists and sociologists in these countries would say okay it doesn't work this way if we look at the labor market functioning what is at stake is occupational mobility the career pattern would go on occupational level not on a firm basis okay and basically this would be a lot built on um, apprenticeship okay well you all know it's important in germany now you have to know that before Thatcher, it was also important in Great Britain, <laughs> okay? And so at this point, you had a lot of occupational labor market going on, built on apprenticeship and built on strong uh, union and, and social partners relations, industrial relations, sorry. So this was like the old or reference picture. And from then, since the 1990s and year 2000, there has been a lot of study that would conclude on the to the decline of ILMs, okay? They would either conclude that from, well, the basic idea that seniority as a go governance criterion for career would be less and less employed, less and less frequent, less and less what well, would be a decreasing importance, okay? It wouldn't be as a job ladder, okay? And again, also would be less and less important in determining so on this basis, this empirical result, well, a lot of several authors, here are some examples of such papers, several authors would say, okay, this is the end of internal labor markets. The internal labor market we would previously see were really based on seniority, okay? Basically, you would come in at, at a young age and basically know exactly what your career would be and basically have a very stable evolution well, not stable, but uh, pre, um, uh, you could anticipate it very much, given your seniority. And that would be for France and the, and the US, this crucial role for seniority in a firm as a basis for your career. And the decreasing role for seniority has been interpreted as the end of ILMs. 
Okay? And on the other side, well, for Britain, as I said, it's uh, since the Thatcher's year, uh, well, the complete change of industrial relation have actually also down, completely downplayed the role for apprenticeship. But also in Germany, it appears that it was less and less important in career building. So there again, there also, sorry, there would be the idea that you would have less occupational labor market. Okay, so the year 2000 was really the time where most people would say, this is not anymore an important or a heuristic tool to understand the functioning of our labor markets. Basically, <laughs> this is uh, uh, where we stand for most people. And so most of them would say that it's the end of the segmentation story. Basically, the year 2000 would sound as the end of the segmentation story. Well, what we argue in this article is that actually this shift away from the concept of ILM, this uh, turning the head uh, to somewhere else or to other concepts, is basically, well, what arg I argued is that this is the consequence of focusing on a very empirical and static representation of what ILMs would be, okay? This is actually because the focus was too much on the actual practice, the actual functioning of ILMs, uh, okay, when practices changed, and obviously practices work organization has changed, well, when these practices have changed, people would say, okay, this is the end of ILMs. But what I would say would be, this is the end of this type of ILM. And basically, as we say in French, you shouldn't uh, throw the baby with the baby's bath water. <laughs> and the idea is, okay, maybe what we need to look at is more, well, step away from the actual form of ILM and understand what is the underlying concept. And coming back to the underlying concept, now we can ask ourselves, is it still useful? Okay? If we look at actual HR practices, okay, they have changed. This is no doubt. But if we step back and look at segmentation as a theoretical approach, well, maybe it's not so uh, past or not so uh, obsolete. Well, this is at least the better or the challenge we, we have raised here. So the main point here is that we need to step away from the 1970s empirical definition of ILM. And there, this opens the way for potential accuracy of ILMs today. Of course, it's still potential. There's no proof here. I don't know if there's a proof at the end of the paper. But basically, for the start of the paper, we just want to open <coughs> the door for potential accuracy. Um, so the, the way to open this door is to stand back and have a more conceptual definition of ILM and not this like, uh, I'm sorry, I have old French expression like image d'épinal, not this uh, stereotypic uh, version of ILMs in the way they would function in the 1970s, like the big Renault factory from the 1970s and we need to step away from that. The first need here is, well, it's, it's going to be a two-step version. The first point is having a more conceptual version of ILM. This is this slide. And the next slide is a bit st stepping aside from the paper is what does that say <laughs> about segmentation overall and not only ILMs. But for this first point is about ILM. As a reminder, what Doringer and Puri started to define as uh, ILM is what they actually found from the 1960s. By the end of the 1960s, they did a lot of monographic analysis, so qualitative study of big firms in, in the Massachusetts. And they would find that the, some big units would actually develop very particular uh, HR practices that they would define as the ILMs. And they would define those in theoretical terms as units within which the pricing and allocation of labor is governed by a set of administrative rules and procedures. Okay, so I don't know if you, yeah, you're all economists. So basically, you know that this is stepping aside from the market. Okay, basically they were putting a, a door, a, a foot out of the, <laughs> out of the market representation of the labor market, well, the competitive representation of the labor market, which was of course the standard one at the time. So they would say no. Wage is not determined by market forces. It's some places, it is determined 
Well, the pricing, we mean wage, and the allocation, who works where? So the, the buying the good in this labor market, the price and the allocation is actually not governed by market rules, but by administrative rules, okay, and procedures. Here the term administrative is not in the French way of it, it's really about governance rules inside the firm, okay? Meaning that basically when firms would decide price, well, the wage they would offer, or would decide who to put on what job, they wouldn't only refer to market forces. They would definitely have other things in mind. This is what they point at, okay? So this is what we want to build on, coming back to this crucial point, and not the idea of what is exactly the way the, uh, the career are built, but really the conceptual uh, note of it. And the way we've put it, to try and get it in a more dynamic, intertemporal version, is the idea that internal labor market are units that offer more than market conditions to their workers, okay? So the idea is, okay, it's not market conditions that decides for them what's happening, but it's also specific in the sense that they are offering their workers more than the market conditions, meaning more than what the workers would find elsewhere, okay? The notion of market conditions is here, like the outside option what a worker could find elsewhere. Well, in an ILM, he would have more, which is a quite general uh, idea, but basically, in a bit more precise way, is would be to say that ILM are those firms who provide resources for career development. Okay, they provide resources. So they don't draw the exact pathway of the career development, but here we step a bit back and say, okay, they provide the opportunity for career development, okay? With the simple idea of a career development as the opportunity for secure employment and wage progression, okay? Having secure employment in its own is not a career. Basically, staying on minimum wage for 40 years in the same supermarket cashier position is not having a career, okay? It's having a stable job, and this happens a lot. And basically, on the other side, having um, a wage progression, but changing all the time and uh, with um, unchosen, um, uh, yeah, well, un unchosen mobility. Uh, oh, sorry, the word is going. Um, isn't also giving opportunities, okay? If you're firing people every two months, not giving them the opportunity to stay if they want, is also not giving secure employment, not giving internal labor market uh, uh, resources. Okay, so this would be the way to have a more general concept, basically defined a bit more precise and just more than market, being having resources for career development, and this idea that career development is wage and stability. And it's, <laughs> once again, I insist, the opportunity for uh, wage progression and secure employment, employment, meaning it's not this uh, very stable or uh, predefined career path. Another important point, which isn't totally new actually, but it's much, well, much less well known from the 1970s labor se segmentation literature, is that such policy may actually favor stable workers inside the firm, meaning inner career inside the firms, but also, it may also be the idea that some ILMs do favor career, do give career opportunity, but even outside the firms, okay? And this, well, this has been spotted actually by purists since, uh, no, sorry, there's no reference to pure here, but uh, in the mid 70s, he would al already point that for some people, basically at the top of the manager positions, well, for them, internal labor market would mean going from one firm to the other for their career, okay? So this idea that internal labor market would enable either inside a career, but also outside a career, was already there in this the theoretical scheme, okay? So, well, obviously we, we wanted to keep it uh, today in a today version of internal labor market because obviously, you know, <coughs> about increased mobility in the labor market. So this, we want to have the opportunity to integrate that in our scheme. So in the end, we have two potential profile of ILM. 
internal, those sustaining internal carriers and those sustaining interfirm carriers. And again, this was already the case in Fuhrer's work. The second slide, which isn't totally in the paper, developed in the paper, <coughs> is the segmentation side of it. You know, well, uh, maybe, I don't know if you remember, <laughs> but basically the genius part of no Doinger and Puri's work is linking the concept of internal labor market to the concept of dualism in the labor market. The two actually exist separately. What is crucial in their work was to say that actually dualism was rooted in the existence of internal labor market. Okay? So dualism is not due to or segment labor market segmentation, uh, dual labor market segmentation, is not rooted in difference in individual characteristics as it's usually spotted and used to be at the time and still today. Usually when you're speaking about dual labor market, while well people would speak about those with short-term contract versus those with long-term contract or those with no qualification versus those with qualifications, but then always pointing at individual characteristics, which is crucial because after that you're doing public policy aiming at changing their individual characteristic. Whereas what the segmentation framework says is no, what is crucial, what is the driving force is firms HR policy, okay? And it is because some firm have internal labor markets that actually this creates and fuels the dualism in the labor market, okay? So if you want to do something about it, you have to have policy aiming at changing firms practices and not only individual profiles, okay? So this is to me very important theoretically because it has huge consequence in policy uh, terms. Maybe we can come back to that in the discussion if you want to, but here just some word. Well, basically dualism, so the idea that some firm has have these internal labor market policy, they would actually offer these working conditions not to all workers, okay, but only to some of them, those who have the expected characteristics and because they're avoiding, or because they're, yeah, having barriers at the entry, this is what creates dualism, okay? Because some individual profile will never get access to those firms and would actually have to uh, go to other firms which have mm -hmm. just normal non-investment in their workers, okay? Like, uh, <coughs> and because it is closed, to, because the entry is selective and close to some people, this is where you have a, a, a macro scheme and the idea of segmentation. So you're building here the idea that this macro segmentation is the consequence of the existence of some firms having ILMs and not all, okay? <coughs> so an another point is actually the one who, well, there is actually in this, in this original scheme of Doringer and Puri and a specific work of Puri with Susan Berger, the politist, and he would develop the idea that the labor demand segmentation is actually fueled by a la labor supply segmentation, but I'm not going to go into all that now. Uh, because I want to go a bit more into the results of this <laughs> article, so a, a bit further than that. So, in the end, we have this more conceptual framework, more open, like career opportunity firms, which allows us to understand uh, a dynamic version of ILM and not stick to the empirical definition of what was existing in the 1970s. And uh, here I would uh, underlie that this is basically coherent with a lot of work by well, institutionalist colleagues in labor economics uh, all over the world, and maybe the work you would have heard of is Osterman's on high road practices and high road firms, which would obviously be another coherent version with the idea that some firms would have these high road practices, and these are the ones we would point at as close to the ILM profile. So, in this paper, sorry. <coughs> 
So yeah, in this paper, we will focus on ILM, looking at ILM, and we won't have the empirical, uh, well, the time and the length of the paper does not, uh, and the data set also does not enable us to follow how this impacts on labor mobility. Of course, this is the crucial point, linking HR practices to labor mobility, but this is a crucial point to understand segmentation, but here we're focusing still on ILM. So this paper is focused on the notion of ILM and a specific type of ILM, we are focused on the one enabling internal careers, okay? So the one that actually focus on careers that happen inside them, okay? So you have to keep in mind before I go further in the results in the paper that all that we're not talking about is not secondary labor market. You can also have other types of internal labor market that exist next to the one we are defining, okay? I'm saying that if there's any British colleague of your, among you, so that they won't be too depressed when they will see the size of the share of ILMs in the British labor market, you'll see. So um, the research question is, can we detect ILM profiles in France and Britain? And what is their prevalence in both countries? What is the frequency? And basically, what do they look like? Once we said we have to step back from what we knew from the 70s, well, we, have, we want to know what do they look like nowadays? And what we bring to this debate and to this question, well, basically this concept, this dynamic concept of ILM, but also the richness of our data, I said a word on it already, and the comparative view. I will make a point on that a bit later, showing the results. So now let's come to the empirical part of the paper. So the data I'm talking about are the WHERE's and REPONSE survey. So WHERE's the British version, REPONSE the French version. Actually, what was very nice for us is that the French survey, its first wave in 1993, was actually built to resemble the British survey. It was built on the model of the British survey. So basically, these surveys, they are focused on industrial relations. So they have a huge set of questions on industrial relations in the firm. And they have actually several questionnaires and questionnaires for a representative of the employer, but also a questionnaire for the representative of the workers and also questionnaires for workers. So it's a three level linked employer employee data. And what is really nice is, is the wide range of questioning that is at stake meaning there are questions on industrial relations, as I said, but there's also a lot of questions on HR practices, on work organization, on technology, on technological change and organizational change, on corporate governance, and whatever you ask, there is. I mean, there's a 50-page questionnaire. It's really, really rich, okay? So you can have really a broad range portrait of firms, and you can connect what they're doing in HR with what they're doing in training, what they're doing, what, what is their position in the market as a seller, etc. So it's a really nice um, survey for this reason. And so it's a survey that is approximately every seven years and it has been so in France and Britain. And we've been using the 2004 and 2011 version of it. And well, there's a 2017 version for France but not yet for Britain. I mean, there won't be a 2017. Hopefully the next wave will be coming to the two countries, but the British decided, you know what, industrial relation was not so important as you guess, <laughs> and stopped this survey. But while well, the colleagues are actually trying to intense lobbying to have it back, but well, we'll see. Um, actually the first work uh, comparing these two surveys, bringing together these two surveys was a lot of work, obviously and you have these two questionnaires. And it's really tricky because you have some practices that just sound the same in the two countries but are really different. I mean, if you did a little comparison, international comparison, you know about that. And I mean, you live in a foreign country, you know about that. Some things seem to be similar, but they're not when you look at the actual practice. So it was really useful. We were an international team with Thomas and we see and I, French, and Alex Bryson and George Forth, the British part of the team. And we would do this whole translation of the survey 
in both language and translation also of the concept. We would really double check that what we've put face to face was actually comparable, okay? And we actually, um, I'm telling you all that because there's a link here where we've put all the material. If you want to work on this base, on this data set, well, all the material is given here, the translations and the, quote, the, quote, the Stata codes for building the linked data set, okay? So pointing as what is comparable and how. So in the end, well, the scope of analysis is obviously the smaller of the two, like the British, in the British context, they have the public service and we don't have, so obviously the, the linked survey is only private sector and establishment with 11 or more employees. So, and yeah, another restriction from the French data is that the employee questionnaire is only a pass to, to workers with at least one year uh, tenure, okay? So we don't have very short tenure workers. And basically in the end, we have nearly 3,000 establishment uh, interrogated for France and 1,000 for WERS. It's really smaller because actually in the full set of WERS, you also have public service, you have less than 10 workers and we had to get rid of that to be coherent with the French um, scope. And the number of employees is more than 10,000 in both countries, okay? For, for these 10,000 workers, we have the information for their employer, okay? And we can connect the two, okay? So the first point is how did we define ILMs? So as I said, the idea is to define firms that would combine high wage and high tenure. So, well, The first step to do that is, well, we separately defined firms with high wage and firms with high tenure, and after we crossed the two questions, okay? The way we defined firms with high tenure is we took the employee side of the linked employer-employee data set, okay? So each line is an employee, and we estimate tenure equation with controlling for gender, age, and education, and then, so we have here a fixed effect that is esti estimated for each firm, G, okay? So you have several individuals for each firm and for each uh, uh, estimation, we would have how it departs from the expected tenure, meaning given the gender, age, education information, okay? We would have from this part of the equation, we can deduce an expected tenure. We have the error term here and what is left here is how actual tenure do depart from expected tenure in this firm, okay? Because we have several individuals per firm, we would look for each of them. Okay, what is the expected tenure give, uh, yeah, given gender, age, and education? And how, on average, does it depart from that in this firm? Okay, so this can be, of course, positive or negative, and uh, would differ from one establishment to the other. Same for wage, we would look at expected wage for the given gender, age, education, and tenure, okay? And see how actual wage would depart from that at the firm level, on average at the firm level. And this is what these two fixed effects would give us, okay? So how actual practices in this firm depart from what would be expected given the individual profile. So basically the idea is, this gives us information like the, what the person would find on the market, like the alternative position. What wage can a person expect given gender, age, education, and tenure, and how does it depart from that? Okay, so the idea is here we could point at firms paying more than average and those paying less than what is expected. Not than average, but because it's not average way, <laughs> it's corrected for these characteristics. So how firms would depart from what is expected given their workers' characteristics, okay? So this firm fixed effect, well, of course, we have a distribution of this fixed effect, and we point at firms whose fixed effect is over the median, okay? So they are among those 50% who pay more than what is expected, 
okay? They are the upper part of the distribution. And we spot at this upper part of the distribution for wage on the one hand and for tenure on the other hand. Let's go directly to this, which is, well, once we've put together like the set of firms which are over tenure for a wage fixed effect, over, ever, over median, sorry, for wage fixed effect, okay, those paying more than median uh, uh, for their wage, and those having a tenure that is more than median, and the idea is we define ILM as those firms who match the two, who have the two characteristics at the same time, okay? The important point here is that if I have told you this, for uh, like imagine I would have only France, okay? I would have told you, okay, we're going to point at the firms paying important wage and those paying, having important tenure, and we're going to see if there's the same one. Well, you would, you would have found that some have the two characteristics together, and it would somehow would sound quite tautological, okay? Because, okay, come on, it's normal. Mm -hmm. These are the ones who pay more, and they are the ones where people stay more. What we can see is this. when we do comparative analysis, and this is the strength of the comparative analysis here, is that it doesn't work like this all the time. So there's nothing totally tautological or natural to that, to having this double high tenure, high wage profile, okay? And actually, in the British case, the firms where tenure is high are not the same ones where wage are high, okay? Much more often than in France. This is what we see here. So basically, we have the percentage for Britain and for France, and the share of workplace which present more than, uh, well, high wage fixed effect and high, wage, high tenure fixed effect. There are 16% in Britain and 38 in France. Okay, so here you see it's not quite, there's no norm in having the two together. Okay, for Britain, you have a lot of firms who actually have very high tenure, but not especially high wage, or the reverse. Okay, so it's much more heterogeneous. Whereas this confirms that what I would see at the French labor economies, the cumulative effect I was talking about in the start of this talk, well, is not the case everywhere. Okay, it is typically French. This cumulative effect of firm good characteristics on the one side and bad characteristic on the other side is typical of this country and does not happen every time everywhere. And especially happens much less often in Britain. Okay? And it's also true if you look in terms of share of employees. It's only 16% of employees that are concerned in Britain and 40% in France. So now just a word to tell you, of course, these numbers cannot be interpreted in terms of levels. They would totally depend on our s ourselves setting the threshold at the median or the average, or only like the first quartile, which all would have been a viewable, I mean, as definition, okay, as empirical definition. So that's another point where comparative analysis is crucial. Because the only important thing about these numbers is the difference between the two countries. It's not the level, okay? You cannot conclude from that that 40% of the workers in the French labor market are just well off and it's horrible for the others, okay? This number, again, if I changed a little the definition, I could bring this number to 30 or 50 or whatever. This is not important. What is important is given a common definition a common method, a common data set, et cetera, we really can compare and we can say that it's more than twice as, uh, twice lower in Britain, twice less frequent in Britain, okay? We, the only thing we can do with these numbers is comparative analysis. So once again, uh, I would insist that this is where the comparative point is important. So I suspect, it, well, I hope it's clear on the, on the way we defined ILM. And now I'm going to say a word on, well, basically who is em uh, employed in these and what type of HR practices do they have 
and what type of firms are concerned, and the conclusion. So I must speed up because <laughs> I'm already at 50, 45 minutes. So who is in ILMs? Well, this is the part that I suspect if I would present that in the 1970s, I would have the same slide. Okay, it would be much younger, but the same slide. And so basically it's more men, more middle age, higher education workers, uh, uh, individuals, and in some occupation, which are rather high skills, because you have more managers, more professional and technicians, and more associate professionals, but also more clerks. Okay? And this slide basically could be really, really close to what we would see before. And so this again could be said strictly as it was said before, that we can see here that we're spotting at the workers with the most bargaining power in the labor market, and we can again see some uh, potential segmentation effect. Okay. Of course, again, this is not a demonstration or proof of the segmentation effect, but still, it's a hint of it that not everyone can get into these profile firms, these type of firms. So it's in line with what has been said, I've told a word about it by Berger and Puri, about the idea of double segmentation, that labor demand segmentation will be fueled on labor supply segmentation. And only those with, again, the more bargaining power would get access to these firms. Um, <coughs> so what do these firms do in terms of HR practices? I've said we need to step back from what their representation from the 1970s and the idea with seniority pay and seniority progression. But still, what's happening in these firms now? The first thing is that Maybe this is a, a, a bit against what you would expect. The, these are firms where you don't have less dismissals than elsewhere, but you actually have less quits. Remember, tenure is important. The thing is, it's not because firms dismiss less workers, it's because workers quit less. Okay? So the point is, how do firms obtain that worker quit less? How do firms obtain that fir worker want to stay and basically are motivated to stay stable in these firms? And it's this way that it works, okay? It's uh, basically giving the conditions for workers to want to stay. So we're going to see that <coughs> on three levels. What, are t what type of incentives? How is this achieved? <coughs> what, is, what are the incentives put in place? One first type of incentives is giving career opportunities. The second time is giving high pay, okay, classic opportunities in labor economics. But also we'll see, we will look at a set of various HR practices and we'll see the are distinguish on this side also. Okay, let me say a word on the method here. Um, <coughs> we did not want to do econometrics here because we don't want to see the impact of one practice, everything else being equal. No, we want to look at actual I uh, ILM, what do they look like, okay? Uh, everything else being unequal, because <laughs> this is what characterizes how they are. So here you have the share, let's say the share of quits in ILM firms, so 6.3. How this differs from the average, well, from the share of quits in other firms, and how significant is this difference? Okay, so quits are less frequent and this is very significant. This is for Britain, this is for France. So this is a result I actually al al already talked about in the previous slide. For the others, uh, unfortunately, uh, I'm, I'm quite sure I won't have time to go through all the results, but basically what you can see is that, well, more often in, in ILMs do you have Vacancies filled internally, like employer would say, they would favor internal filling of vacancies. Okay, so this is, we interpret that as opportunity for internal career. And on the same way, if you look at employee uh, side of the question here, you see that in these firms, employee are more often declared being promoted in the last three years. As you can see, we had to get here questions that are not strictly similar in the two questionnaires. So for some of them, we don't have the counterpart for the other country. But we try to put them together as hints of internal careers. Um, 
so again, about the expectation about promotion, it's significantly more important in ILMs in France. And the share of permanent contract and full-time worker is also full-time contract is also more important. So here we would have very classic characteristic of better jobs, I would say, and potential internal uh, career opportunities. Another point here, I maybe won't go totally through it. Here is how pay uh, relatively uh, um, how the dis. Oh, sorry, um, wage control for tenure, okay? Because we, don't, we, want, we want to see more than wage level, we want to see how wage evolves with tenure. And we would see that, well, first thing, if you don't look at the, the lower part of the table, you have the general situation, and you see that for whole workers, I mean, not ILM workers, tenure is more important in France than in the UK. Okay, that's the first point. The second point is being in an ILM has a high and significant impact on wage in both countries. And the third point from this table is here is the combined influence of being in an ILM and having tenure. And you can see here that the influence of being in an ILM on wage is only for very long tenure, 10 plus, okay? Meaning the ILM bonus on pay actually comes much more quickly than what we would expect from the 1970s version of ILMs, okay? The bonus you have on pay is whatever your tenure. It's beginning, it's even higher when you're 10 years and more tenure, but you have a bonus on pay even for shorter tenure. Okay, I finish here with the table because they're even longer, the other ones, so I kind of synthesize the results, but you all have the paper, I think. Um, so, in terms of payment systems, so now if we go and look about a bit more about HR practices, well, they have more in France. It's significant only for France, and we don't have always equivalent for the Britain for this type of question. But we have share ownership plans, bonus schemes, merit pay, profit sharing schemes, so very sophisticated payment schemes that tend to attach the worker. Okay, because profit sharing plans, you're supposed to stay five years before you get it or what? I mean, for different, uh, uh, the rules are different for each of these systems, but they kind of all build on the fact that you are willing to uh, fit with the uh, firm's objective. If you look at employment relations and voice, here, very interestingly, we have the same idea as for the 1970s version, that these are firms where union uh, membership is higher and they are more often representatives but in the British case you don't have more bargaining but basically because firm level bargaining is beginning is now very rare in Britain okay but in France it's also firms where you have more firm level bargaining so here again some characteristics that hold from the 1970s version but the main difference from the 1970s here you would spot is the very different pay system, okay? Less focus on seniority and much more focus on diverse um, performance pay schemes. In terms of skill development, here again, we are cl close to what we would expect from before, a lot of training opportunities for workers in ILM, being on the job training or off the job training. And the last point is about work organization. And here it's only uh, significant for France, but you have a lot of uh, new high performance work organization schemes like teamwork, autonomous production teams and problem solving groups. So quite different from the image we would have from the 1970s ILM once again. The next point is, so just to, say, uh, to conclude with a word on this section, for the HR practice, what is really different, I mean, you have common traits with the 1970s, like high pay, training, uh, union, role for union and bargaining, etc. But you also have the main difference, I would say, is the role for innovative work organization in France and performance pay system. Okay, these two traits are really typical of the year 2000 and wouldn't exist in the 1970s description of ILMs.
So now let's have a look at the firm characteristics, structural characteristics. Well, here again, it's a bit when we looked as when we looked at individual characteristic. It's really close from the old version of ILMs, meaning you have very large firms, more than 250, which is quite structural. I mean, if you, we're looking at, as a reminder, we're looking at internal career. Basically, when you have 10 workers, you can't do a lot of space for internal career. Okay, so this only happens in very big firms. That is what we see. And also very old firms, more than 20 years, which is also basically quite intrinsic to the idea to having uh, stable employment. You can have very young firms with very stable employment. Um, they are more often in some sectors, like manuf the one that classic as before, like manufacturing utilities. You also can see uh, construction, which is not so classic, and other business services which is by basically what we could have also as financial services and all the um, uh, uh, <coughs> uh, consulting services to firms. And especially little of these ILM in wholesale, retail, hotel, uh, public administration, other personal services. Okay. Importantly, well, here's the last point on the profi firm profile on the competitive setting. And here ch things change a lot re regarding which country we're looking at. As we saw, there are some differences in HR practices, but a lot of the traits were common. Here, when we're looking at the competitive setting, well, they appear to be quite different. What is common to the two is that they are operating in large market, okay, at least national. If you're a local producer, you have less chance to have an ILM. But whenever we look more from that, we have to distinguish basically the two countries because also the questions are different in the questionnaires. But also the image they would render about the profile, you'll see are quite different. For the French ILMs, their market share is not dominant, but basically, once again, they're national or international market, okay? Very rare to be dominant in this size of market. The volume of the business is either stable or decreasing, Okay, so well, these also goes with the fact that they're very big and very old firms. Okay, they're not startups, obviously. But on the other side, they have a, com a competitive strategy that is more often than others based on innovation, originality, or quality, or rather than price. Okay, so their competitive strategy is some kind of high road too, like in line with the uh, HR practices. They have, remember, problem solving groups and a lot of autonomous groups and a lot of performance pay. So they try to embark the worker into their project. And actually, this is also in line with the fact that they are competing in uh, specific originality or quality of their product and in innovation. And their financial performance is above average, but not significantly above average. Okay. Our data on this is quite crude, but it's a hint of a result. It's, we, we would need more data to be more precise on that. On the other hand, the British side of ILM is that, well, here it's quite different. The market they're on is said to be mature or declining. Uh, so again, on the second half, this would be quite <coughs> close to the stable or decreasing situation for fonts. But on the other hand, on the other hand, <coughs> they are not leader, and they do not uh, build on developing new product services or techniques. Okay, they are not at all in an innovative or qualitative strategy. Okay, so this is uh, again coherent with the fact that their work organization is very little innovative, very classic. Okay, um, but their financial performance is above average. Okay, which is quite counterintuitive uh, against any management uh, strategy or, or workbook. Uh, that so, well, our interpretation of that is that they have a specific ILM profile that may actually be built on sectoral rents. Okay, so they're in very specific sector, and at some point they may be just uh, using natural or whatever source of rents they would build on. Okay, to pay high wage and uh, give high tenure. So it's a rent they would share to some extent, 
but they were not entertained by any strategy in terms of HR strategy. What do we conclude from that? So, um, well, the first point is we actually conclude that the notion of uh, ILM is still accurate, still useful to understand the functioning of the labor market. And, well, we do have firms that combine stability and high wage and offer inner career. This sounds e somehow normal once again, but come on, you never hear about that. Everything is about you have to move, your career is going to be moving from one firm to the other. Everyone is supposed to be moving either on the bad side of the labor market or on the good side, but everybody's talking about moving. And basically what this says is, well, still, there's a lot of people who actually have their career inside uh, a, a firm, and this is still very pregnant in the French labor market, at least. These firms have quite classic profiles in HR practices in regarding training, pay levels, uh, good uh, type of contract, full-time, etc. but they're also uh, having some specific trait, especially for France, on work organization and payment system. Okay? So they have been quite innovative on this side regarding to what was existing uh, up to the 1980s. And so the second point here is well, we can make the hypothesis in more theoretical terms that there would be national version of ILMs, meaning national profile, national way to embody ILMs. Okay? It's not always the same. So you could conclude on that, that maybe uh, we need, in the same way, you remember in the 70s I told you the notion of ILM would be OLM in the British, uh, so occupational labor market. So here, we may have a different variant of ILM in national way to em um, embody it. Um, do I have time for a word? Well, here, basically, the idea is we looked at the several, um, I told you, these surveys, the, they have been run every seven years, more or less. So we basically try to estimate the, the share of ILM uh, increase or decrease or stay stable over these years. So I'm not going to insist on to how we did that, but basically we could compare 2004 and 2011 for UK and see that what well, is quite stable. And for France, we would have the three last waves, 2004, 11, and 17. And it's stable, but still decreasing if we're comparing with the very start of the period. So this I use this um, table basically to raise this question. Should we have a public policy to sustain ILMs? Okay, is that the way we want to uh, open the debate? Is that the way we want to intervene in the labor market? And if we want to do that, how? So that may be a point we will discuss. Um, well, and the last slide here is about the opening question or the research extension from this paper. One is actually already really advanced in terms of, well, looking more about national models. Because we have this, uh, this is one of the work we did on comparative analysis, but we did, I don't know, a lot of them, <laughs> and colleagues also did some. Uh, so basically, in the end, we wanted to say, okay, what do these micro data representative survey tell us about national models. Okay, like we have this typical liberal economy, British model, and um, typical model, I mean macro defined uh, uh, national models. And here we'd say, okay, what, ma what macro national level trait we could build on micro data? And typically one of them is the fact that the Whatever you're looking at, there is much more heterogeneity in the British labor market. And so we're saying, okay, this can be also said as one typical characteristic of the British situation, okay? There is more heterogeneity and it's less explained by individual characteristics or institution or whatever. It's much more heterogeneous, whatever you're looking at. Another question is, well, basically coming to the full picture, basically coming to segmentation. 
how this, does the existence of this type of ILM profile do impact worker mobility? Okay, we saw you had a specific worker profile in these ILMs, but then it's another next step empirically to really study how this impacts the labor market mobility and how this, uh, well, basically blocks some other people outside of having access to this good job and good employment opportunity. Because obviously in terms of public policy, what is urgent is maybe making this island bigger or opening the doors to more valued people. Whatever the option, we need to, there, there is a need to do something. And the last point, well, is looking for inter-firm ILMs. As I said, this was in, given the conceptual tool we've had now. Well, this, there is totally the space for these inter-firm ILMs, and we would want to look at those and see basically how they characterize in, in a common way to that it could be. Okay, so now I'm finished. Sorry, it's a bit longer than expected.